In this video, I want to talk about glucagon signaling cascade. So, glucagon is a hormone that is of a particular class. That particular class is a peptide or polypeptide. So, I'll just put here polypeptide. It's about 29 amino acids long. And it is, if you recall, polypeptides or peptide hormones are categorized as polar hormones, so they'll be acting via systems in which they would act, attach or bind to receptors that are on the cell's surface. And specifically, glucagon will also be part of a G protein coupled receptor. Now, glucagon is released specifically from the alpha cells of the islets of Langerhans of the pancreas, so that the ductless gland is the pancreas, specifically the alpha cells of the islets of Langerhans. So, what is glucagon's function? When you think about glucagon, you think, oh no, glucose is gone. So, glucagon responds when to to when glucose is gone. So, it responds specifically to low blood glucose levels. So, if it's gone, make more. So, essentially, glucagon, what its role is, it acts on liver cells to increase blood glucose levels. So, if it, it responds to low blood glucose levels by making more. So, how does it do that? Well, if... It does something to glycolysis. If you recall, glycolysis breaks down glucose. So if we want to increase blood glucose levels, do we want glycolysis to happen? No, we don't want to break down glucose. We want to stop it. So we decrease or suppress, uh, or excuse me, by decreasing glycolysis, right? Or suppressing glycolysis. We want to stop the breakdown of glucose because we want to make it. So we would increase gluconeogenesis. So glucagon increases blood glucose levels by stopping the breakdown via glycolysis and increases the production of it by act by going through gluconeogenesis. Now this does this only on liver cells, not on muscle cells. So glucagon via a G protein coupled receptor. Glucagon will come in and it'll bind it's G protein coupled receptor. And the G protein, of course, is a stimulatory G protein, initially inactive with its GDP. It gets replaced with a GTP and therefore is active, heads over to adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase makes a bunch of cyclic AMPs from ATP. Now it'll activate protein kinase A, so it takes it from a less active state to a more active state. Now, what do these protein kinase A's do? They're going to act on target proteins to add phosphate to them. Now, before we start talking about these target proteins, these enzymes, let's review them really quickly. So, the target proteins, there are PFK2 and FBP, FBP ACE, excuse me, that's a typo, or a RIDO, FBP ACE2. So, PFK2 is phosphofructokinase 2. So what that does is that makes F26BP, which is fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, and I'll go over that in just a second. Fructose bisphosphatase 2 degrades fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. So what is fructose 2,6-bisphosphate? Well, if you recall, the reason why it's important, at least in our discussion here, is that high fructose 2,6-bisphosphate levels allosterically activate glycolysis, whereas low concentrations of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate allosterically activate gluconeogenesis. Now, this, this second point here is not something we've actually talked about, but it is the case. Um, this, when I, this point up here, though, however, we de definitely have talked about in previous videos. The allosteric regulation video on glycolysis. Now, the other two enzymes here that are important here are PFK1, which is phosphodokinase 1. And the relevance here is that it's a regulated step of glycolysis. And here, 
fructose bisphosphatase 1 is, is uh, a regulated step of gluconeogenesis. So that sort of review, that was pretty rapid and quick, but uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this because this is stuff that we should, that we have already gone over and I hope that you already know for this. So now let's go through how that, how those proteins are affected in this cascade. So protein kinase A, it's going to add phosphates to things. It's going to add a phosphate to PFK2 and to fructose bisphosphatase 2. So it gets those phosphates from ATP in both cases. So PFK2, we just said this is the thing that makes fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. So fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is an activator of glycolysis. So we do not want an activator of glycolysis to be around for glucagon, right? We don't want to break down glucose. We want to make it. So um, PFK2, we want it to be less active. So it starts off more active, and we make it less active. Okay. So in this case, adding the phosphate made this protein less active. But in the case of fructose bisphosphatase 2, which is the thing that breaks down fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, we went it adding the phosphate to it went make it go from a less active state to a more active state so what's what happens here then if pfk2 is less active this is the thing that makes fructose 26 bisphosphate if it's less active that means less fructose 26 bisphosphate will be made now fructose bisphosphatase 2 is the thing that breaks down fructose 26 bisphosphate if it's more active, that means more fructose 2,6-bisphosphate will be degraded. What's the overall effect of this? Less is being made, more is being degraded. So that means we're having less, you know, we have a lower concentration of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Now that fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, what does that do? Well, we said that low levels of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate allosterically activate fructose bisphosphatase 1, which is a part of gluconeogenesis. So this is going to be more active. So if this is more active, this means an increased gluconeogenesis, which means more synthesis of glucose. Okay, This lower fructose 2,6-bisphosphate concentration, um, if there's less of it around, that means there's a lack of allosteric activation of PFK1, which is involved in glycolysis. So this is going to be less active than it normally would be. Less active means decreased glycolysis. If we have decreased glycolysis, that means we have less breakdown of glucose. We're not breaking down glucose for energy as much. So what's the overall effect of that? Well, if we're breaking gluco glucose down less and we're making more of it, we're making more glucose. We have an increased glucose concentration, which is what we wanted glucagon to do. So what glucagon does is it lowers fructose 2,6-bisphosphate concentrations by altering the activity of these enzymes here. And that overall, this, this lower fructose 2,6-bisphosphate concentration alters the activity of this enzyme and this enzyme, and that is what triggers the increased glucose concentration. That's the overall process and how it works. As far as how is this ter signal terminated, same thing as what we did with epinephrine. Cyclic AMP is broken down to AMP by this particular enzyme here, and uh, GT the GTP on the G-alpha subunit is hydrolyzed to GDP. And then the protein phosphatase is remove phosphate groups from target proteins. All of these contribute to termination of the signal. Hope that video was helpful. I'm a tutor. If you live in Southern California, feel free to contact me via email at moofuniversity at gmail.com. See the description below for more details. Thank you for watching.